So, shall we just start in time? Yeah. All right. Uh, those who are late, well, I have to suffer. So, um, welcome to what I claim is the nerdiest talk of the conference. So, I claim the title. Uh, if you don't want to be knee deep in technical details, which are probably irrelevant for your future life, so you might better leave now or you waste the 40 minutes of your life. This is something which is of interest for well, many people inside Red Hat, but not really too many outside, so in other forms of work as well. So I'm talking about really the intricate details of how you know, the CPU is actually executing things. And I will actually use a lot of uh, references to old technology because they are just simpler to this. So you will see this over time. So uh, when, when I talk to people, so they, even if they are coming with a CS background, most of them really don't have any understanding of how a CPU actually works and what they are operating on and so on. they are thinking of this at the very high level so let's talk at something very simple so so to perform the operations which a CPU is normally supposed to do uh, we have at the very core from the very early on we have something called the ALU arithmetic and logic unit in the earliest days the internet computer only consisted of that so there were paper tapes and paper, uh, not so, uh, card punch cards and so on which are fed in the machine but everything else was uh, uh, simply read from these things, punched or uh, run through the arithmetic and logic unit, and then we have an immediate output of some sort and so on. So this is the very core, and this is how computers to this day exist. The only reason they exist is they can perform something according to the wishes of the user, of the programmer. So, but to do this, we need what is called state. So we need nowadays uh, in the more complex machines, we don't want to have data streaming in, streaming out without any uh, dependence between the different instruction or the different operations which you are performing. So we need to keep track of information. So one of the most obvious ones is we need to have what's called an instruction pointer. So even the simplest model, so if you think back to a Turing machine, in the, so the theoretical aspect of a Turing machine, it had the position on the tape on which it is reading the operation. So we need this kind of information. And that's we still have up to this point. So, but if we want to uh, influence this kind of thing, each CPU itself needs to operate even on something like the instruction pointer. So we need, as the uh, as core part of the CPU, we need instructions which are operating on the way, future way the CPU is actually executing. So we need execution control instructions inside the CPU itself. So, and we are not there anymore that we are hard coding the instructions which are uh, executing on the um, on the CPU itself. So they are now living in either Harvard model or uh, von Neumann model in the CPU in the memory itself. So we need to be able to read uh, instructions from memory. We're keeping state data in memory. Uh, that's the part which is easy to understand. Everyone knows about this. But for a CPU itself, it means that we need to have access inside the CPU to memory. So load and store. This is not something which comes normal. So even in all, in today's machines, you see that we have the CPU, uh, the memory itself is norm is not part normally of the CPU itself. It is somehow attached to it. That's it's a non-trivial way and lots of implications what this means uh, for for the operation of uh, of the CPU itself. So and when we are loading things and so on, what became clear very early on uh, is we need to have some form of representing what is the content of what we're loading there. We cannot just say, well, load from there, do the operation and store it somewhere else. It turns out that this is far too slow, so we get to this later on. So we very early on introduced in computers the concept of registers. These are simply specific high performance uh, locations which are close to the CPU core where we can intermediate the store data for a short period of time for uh, certain operations. And so, on. so we have this kind of uh, infrastructure in the CPU itself, but to be able to utilize them, we need more operations inside the CPU. So we need load and store operations. We need uh, transfer operations of, uh, and we need to move things between different registers. So not just between the memory with load and store, but also between the different registers themselves. So, and the whole thing has to nowadays run on operating system, which adds more requirements. 
requirements on the operations. So we need to actually have operations which allow us to administrate um, the running programs themselves. So in the early days, we only had one single program occupying a single machine at any one time. This became really, really inefficient over time. So now we have uh, in most of the systems uh, and, and a clear distinction between the system mode of the CPU where we can administrate uh, that we can run multiple uh, uh, multiple programs on, on the same machine at the same time as if they would be running uh, on their own. So they themselves don't necessarily have to know about this. And this needs some form of abstraction in the form of some uh, instructions which allow us to perform some system operations mode. So this, as I said, is there not only for isolation, as I said, but also for security reasons. So all of these kind of thing, operations have to be performed by a CPU itself nowadays, but how they actually, how this actually works, well, we're going into some of the details here. So I'm not going into all of this. This is far too much, unfortunately. I don't have a week for you to listen to me, which would at the very least need to actually cover everything. So I will not go into many of the details uh, which are related to the memory handling and so on. It will be just a, sh a very short excursion to that. I'm mostly uh, looking at some of the more nerdy aspects of instruction encoding, which is the next thing we're talking, and how individual instructions actually get scheduled into this, in the CPU and what kind of advancements have been made in the last decades in, in these in this areas. So instruction encoding is something quite abstract to most people. For those who are living in the compiler world and these kind of tools, this is a natural way to think about this. But uh, just imagine we have a general purpose CPU and this we have to tell it somehow what kind of operations it's supposed to do next. Well, we can do this in various different ways. So in the uh, simplest form, which is usually called the three address form, we have something that when we say, well, we encode some in some way or form using a number, we're numbering them through uh, an operation which we can perform. Then we have a source of, or two source operands perhaps, and then we have a destination target somehow specified and that's all in some form which can be stored in, in memory. So that's what the assembler is creating. That's what usually called is machine language, so that we have uh, a sequence of these encoded instructions in memory, which, when they get uh, executed sequentially, uh, perform the operations the program is, is uh, designed to do. So, in the simplest form, an operation, as in this case here, for instance, would operate on two registers. That's all internal to the CPU itself. So we're saying that take the uh, parent for the operation, which is specified in, in the subword there, uh, take the uh, operands, the two operands from these and this register, and once you're done with the operation, store it in that register. So that's the simplest form. Uh, the same thing has to be, in most cases, also allow for a form where some of the operations, uh, some of the operands, or all of the operands are coming from memory. At the very least, this has to be done for operations like load and store, the things which I mentioned at the beginning, that uh, in load and store we have to somehow encode a memory address from which we want to load the data or where we want to store the data, and in this case also a register in the sense. So it's uh, the register from which the data is taken or in which it is stored. So these are some of the simple instructions which we can encode. Other things, uh, uh, other operations might slightly vary. Might maybe I need a couple of different uh, fields in there, but in general, this you get the, get the gist. This is the kind of thing where we have to do and how we can encode this. How this looks in practice for different processes is actually quite different. In the what is called RISC world, reduced instruction set com uh, uh, computers, um, we have usually the instructions encoded in 32-bit words. So there are variants, we have compressed formats, we have truncated formats and so on, um, where this is somehow made smaller. This is mostly done for embedded systems, but in for risk systems, most of the time we have 32 bits available to encode all the instructions with all the parameters, etc. So what you see here, both at the top is where you have a single instruction being represented, encoding of the instruction represented, and at the bottom 
bottom, which is an overview over the uh, different instruction levels. This comes from Risk V, which is uh, a completely freely, openly developed uh, CPU architecture, initially out of Berkeley. And you see that it's really uniform in the sense that you have different fields inside the um, in, inside the 32-bit words, which makes up the instruction, which makes it very easy for a logic for for a hard-coded logic in the form of an AC, ASIC or something like this to get to the individual pieces of information. We all, always know that within, let's say, uh, 12 bits inside the word, we find that this is always the destination register. It's some form of register, and we get this information out. There's no decoding needed. We just need to get this out. And the actual instruction which is to be performed can also be very easily looked up. So you see there the, the errors originating there from some of the first bits in the words, in the 32-bit words. They are the ones which are used to access this kind of table here. So the table itself describes what kind of operations at the high level are to be performed if these bits, these five bits, are uh, have a certain value. So for instance, all kinds of load instructions have all the five bits which you're seeing here to be zero. So in this case, we can just write some very simple logic in for the CPU itself which is um, uh, accessing well, or initiating the execution of what is the load instruction whenever it sees these zero bits there. It's very simple, it's very fast, there's not much uh, logic necessary, not much uh, electricity necessary to do the decoding there and actually start the execution. On the other hand, this is the exact counterexample. This is how the Exodus 6 instruction format looks nowadays. And if Intel gets their way, it gets complicated with more complicated with every single day. So they are inventing yet more and more of these kind of instruction encoding uh, extensions, and you can imagine. So this is not on a single 32-bit words. All of these blocks, these individual blocks, are, these are individual bytes, and not all of them can appear in the same uh, same order. So you actually have to decode the first byte to know which path to take to decode the second byte. That's a sequential operations. We hate sequential operations. This all has to better be in parallel. So in a risk architecture, we can uh, decode all of them at the same time, all of the different fields. Here we can't. This means that to accelerate these kind of operations and actually perform them in the first place, an enormous amount of logic has to be necessary in what's called the instruction decoder in a sys system like Exodus 6. And if we are, we are going to talk about this more, we want to actually be able to decode more than one instruction at the same time. Imagine the nightmare. So we don't even know where the second instruction starts, leave alone what the individual feeds of the first instructions are. So these kind of operations are requiring lots and lots of logic. There are thousands of, I don't know actually what the norm, so millions of gates necessary just for the decoding and to keep these gates running with need electricity. So you can argue that the instruction decode of one of the high-end Xeon chips probably takes as much energy as an entire ARM chip at a low-end range. It's mind-boggling, but we are stuck with it. So that's something to actually think about when you're uh, when you're, uh, when you're um, looking at the CPUs themselves. If you're not doing this, um, um, if you're looking into a really energy efficient computing and so on, the XD6 really should not come to your mind. And uh, Intel has the problem that they even wanted to base their future um, their, their future architectures, like for instance, you had the ARM, you had the MIG, and so on, still on the XD6 architecture. They simply cannot let go. It's really, really sane. A strange situation for them. So how does it actually, the CPU is now actually executing what, what it's supposed to do? So we, with the instruction format, uh, format I introduced the, the concept of decoding, which is also in here. So, But the actual sequence of uh, executing instruction can be summarized in these steps. And this derives from the fact that, yes, we started out defining what the CPU does, even when we didn't have integrated CPUs, when we still had uh, had transistor logic to make them up explicitly. So we still had this as a sequence. So we are fetching the instruction from memory. 
we are decoding it. That's the thing from the previous slide. We are trying to figure out what does this instruction actually do. Then we have to decode it and find out, oh yeah, here are the parameters, fetch them. Fetching them can mean in different ways. So we can read them from memory. Uh, we can uh, deduce them or get them from the instruction itself. There are so, there are so called immediate instruction, which are decoding parts of the operands for the operation in the instruction itself. Or in hopefully in most cases, the, uh, the, uh, the data comes actually from the registers themselves in there. But in all of that kind of things depend on the decoding to have happened before. Before that, we cannot really start. So and once we have all the parameters in place in wherever they are necessary, we can then finally start the execution. So I'm not sure how many EEs are here and how many of you have then designed your own CPU. You know that if you're writing something like, uh, like an, an ELU, arithmetic and logic unit, it's not as if you say, ah, here are the electric inputs and well, a nanosecond later I expect all the output signals to be available at that point. There are propagation delays, there are lots of logic in the meantime. So there are things which it takes time, in short, to actually finish these kind of operations. So there are uh, limitations when it comes to actually execution. And only if we are reducing the frequency of the chip itself to a really, really low uh, number can we really expect that the propagation doesn't really have an effect. And in the case, uh, I don't know where we ever started on machines where we had less than a megahertz available and uh, for, for CPU frequency at those machines we didn't care about that. We had one single in, uh, single cycle going before we actually had the result of the of the instruction available. That was nice, but over time we sped up the process by a factor of 5,000 or even more. Well, all of a sudden the speed, speed of light and the propagation of signals actually makes a difference. So this is not the case anymore. Then once we have the result we have, uh, of the computation in whatever form it takes, we have to write back the result. This can be into memory, can be into a register, so we also have to update what's called the state of the CPU, usually in the form of, of status facts for arithmetic unit or other things. And once we are done that, we have finished executing the instruction. And that's the way how to this point in logic we are executing instructions. But if if we would constrain ourselves to executing them really like this, so all the sequentially, and before we actually haven't reached the end of five, step five, we cannot step up and, and do this for the next instruction, we could not scale up uh, CPUs to uh, performance levels we are seeing right now. So what I'm going to describe going forward is how this actually works, uh, how, this, how many of these things uh, have been uh, improved over time. But first, well, let's go a step back back in, in history, so anyone knows what kind of CPU this is? Quisp? Pardon me? <laughs> well, uh, it, it could in theory be the Z80, but it's actually the 8080. Yeah, well, no, no, it's 880, which means that this is the hidden registers, which, which were in the, in the 8080. So the Z80 was a successor of it. So I like the 8080 as an example because it's so simple. We actually understand it at the transistor level nowadays. We have everything freely available. So, and I want to go through this, uh, these steps on the example of the 8080 because in theory, really nothing has changed. We have the same components to some extent. They're a lot more complicated and they're working differently and we had some additional components but all of this exists as well. So for step one, for fetching things, what is involved, we have some internal register, the temp register, which is taking the current instruction, which is to be executed, and we load the instruction from the memory. The memory is addressed by, at the bottom right, you see that's an address, register, uh, address bus. So we put the address on the bus, and the next cycle we can read through the data bus, which is on the top, the, the white from memory, which is stored into the temp register. 
then the decoding happens in the case of the 88, that's the PLA, but nowadays it's a lot more complicated, of course, as, as we uh, alluded to before in instruction encoding. So these kind of things uh, used, to used to be very simple. What they are doing is they're uh, setting, the, uh, the setting various of the internal lines to, uh, to address uh, data flow and also the execution selection and so on internally. It's basically a lookup. If this instruction comes in, then set these lines in, in at this time cycle. So next comes the fetching of the parameters. Um, 8080 was a simple machine. It didn't really uh, have the three address form, so there only can be one additional parameter address in every single instruction, so we only need to worry about loading one of them, and that's basically loaded into this temp register, which you see there. The accumulator ACT is an explicit register which you fill itself, so that's always implicitly used in, these, in the arithmetic operations, and to load something, you need to again put something on the address bus or you and, and get it from the data bus in the next cycle or you get this from the register uh, register block on the on the right hand side. So you get everything in there. Then you do the operation. The ALU is, is triggered by the PLA and by the instruction decoding. The PLA sets the appropriate bits to instruct the ALU what kind of operation to be performed and then we write back the results. So either in the uh, in any of the registers, including the ACT register in this case, or we write them out, for instance, for store operations onto the data bus after previously having selected the address using the address buff, and we are also updating the flags. So this is the kind of operation which are going on all the time. But uh, at that point, we are running into one fundamental problem, and that is that we cannot speed this up indefinitely because memory is slow. So if you think about this in the terms of how we used to do, so this is this area, so phi is the clock speed in a one megahertz world with static RAM attached to the CPU, we were able to rely on the fact that after we put the address on the address bus in one cycle, the next cycle we can read the memory memory content. Worked. So, but now let's speed up the whole thing. Two gigahertz clock speeds. Well, now it takes a hundred cycles to read from memory. And just want to imagine what this means. From fetching the memory, is fetching the instruction to memory to the decoding phase, we would have to wait a hundred cycles. Therefore, the frequency would not be two gigahertz. It would be actually 20 megahertz, well, or less. So this is not going to work. We need something. We need to be able to do something in the meantime. So we have to modicize the memory addresses. So we are not loading simply a single byte. We need to actually load more than something like this and make it available inside the CPU itself. Me. Um, we need to do something while the memory accesses are actually happening. So we need to keep the CPU uh, busy. And uh, these are the guiding principles of the last 25 years of CPU design to increase these kind of things, increase what is called the IPC, the instructions per cycle rate, to more than one so that we actually can uh, perform more work there. So. Where this is the, the overview which I'm going to use now, which is describing exactly the same things which you had before, so the, the, the steps with a couple of different additional blocks there. So at the top you have the decoder, which after fetching the instruction from memory is decoding instruction. What has crystallized in the last couple of decades is that after that we actually move things in what's called the decoded instruction cache. Or it has various different names, I just call it this. And this is uh, simply storing the decoded instruction, whatever internal form the developer of the CPU finds useful for each of the incoming instructions, which is not that problematic for a RISC CPU. In theory, we can store it in the RISC, uh, RISC format in there as well, unless we actually want to have something else. But for a SIS CPU like x86, this is crucial because the uh, decoding, as we said, is so complicated. And what is more to the point nowadays, Exodus 6 actual instructions actually don't get executed as is. The Exodus 6 front end actually translates each Exodus 6 instruction in the number of micro-ops, 
which are executed. So the decoded instruction cache actually uh, caches all these micro ops which have been uh, the result of the decoding. So the, after that, we are getting into what's called the real order buffer. So this is something which I'm, I'm going to talk about in detail now. Uh, is is the piece of structure which is pulling out of the, the instruction cache, the decoded instruction cache instructions one after the other once they can be executed. And that's the important part. The first part, the first the decoder and the decoded cache, they are in order, uh, in order, uh, uh, executing all the instructions in order and so on. The rest of them don't necessarily do this and what this means we're going to talk about now. So uh, let's talk what this actually means in in terms of some actual code and I have to apologize that it actually looks a little bit weird now going forward because the, the font for some reason changes changed from the uh, from the time when I actually wrote the slides so there for this is now it's okay but later on you see that there the, the the markers which I have are actually offset by some random number I gave each of the units which you see there an individual number and we are now looking at an instruction so instruction sequence which you can see on the left hand side, how this actually proceeds through the CPU itself. So the first thing is the first instruction, FLD, which is a floating point load, uh, gets decoded. So it's the first that were fetched from memory. Then it gets uh, in a single issue, and we are talking about doing it in a traditional way. So the instruction gets uh, decoded, and then it is um, it can be uh, operated on. So in this case, the instruction is in the decode cache and because there, there is nothing else going on, it can immediately be executed and so on. In the meantime, so remember, we want to do multiple things at the same time. The decoder is not doing anything anymore. So we can actually get to the point that we have the second instruction decoded. Why is there no uh, caching, cache access? Why is there no one in my example here? Remember, one of the things which I said before is we want to amortize uh, accesses. So we don't want to ac access memory for every single instruction. So along with the memory necessary for the first instruction, we get memory for the second, third, and whatever instruction as well. So these kind of things are necessary for performance. We cannot wait on memory every single time. So this is instruction caches and what they are for. So in this case, so we have now some form of parallelism there. So we have the uh, first instruction being actually executed and the second instruction being ex uh, uh, decoded and this continues to be done. So once the execution of the first one is done, so it starts the execution actually and so on, uh, it's, um, it, because it's a load, it also uses the caches, etc. and the uh, the second instruction can be put in the, into the uh, reorder buffer and the third instruction can be started to be executed. So that's actually more efficient already, much more efficient than what we have seen when looking at the 8080 execution model where we had the single instruction in flight at any point in time. But it's still not really that great, specifically because, well, the instructions which you see here, for instance, the, the uh, first and second instruction, they actually are not depending on each other in any way or form. They could even be executed in, in the reverse order without affecting the, the correctness of the program. So what uh, has been done uh, in, in the high-end CPU design is to analyze on the fly while the program gets executed what are the dependencies between the different instructions. And that's what, what is represented here. So here I gave every single instruction a number in sequence. And on the right-hand side, you see a dependency graph of the different instructions. So only if there is a, a straight line, so an, an error pointing between two different nodes, do we actually have dependencies. So which means here, if you look at this, there's no error between one and two and two and three and three and four and five. The first five instructions could actually be executed at exactly the same time. 
if we have the necessary bandwidth there. And it turns out the high-end processors nowadays have these kind of things. So we are talking about multi-issue CPUs where we have decoders which are capable of decoding one and one instruction a cycle and the, the decoded instruction are stored in these caches. <laughs> and, and therefore, if at some point we have enough instruction in, in the decode cache and we have uh, resources to execute them in parallel and there are no dependencies there, we can uh, execute more than one instruction at the same time. This is how we get IPC numbers which are larger than one. That's a very important thing for, for performance there. The other thing is, um, yeah, so that's that's basically um, I have this. So we, this is a uh, the the explanation now in in graphical form. So instead of first being the first instruction being decoded and so on, all of the instructions are decoded. And here again for risk, trivial, because we just know every single instruction is 32 bits in width. For CISC, especially Exodus 6, horrendously difficult. So you see there what, what kind of hoops they have to jump through to actually make this work. And so, and once we do the, uh, the, the decoding, we can all store them in the instruction cache. And depending on uh, what we have in terms of execution units and so on, we might be able to start executing them. But that's not always the case. So we don't always have enough um, execution uh, units. In this case, there's a single one. So even though in this case we have the, uh, the, the second, third, and fourth instruction already decoded, it's already in the reorder buffer. If we are not also having a specialized execution unit, we are still bottlenecking there. So we only have one single uh, operation which we can perform at any single in time, which means that we actually want parallel execution in addition to having parallel uh, decoding, etc., and these kind of operations. So nowadays you will see, if you look at the block diagram of a CPU, yeah, all the long as so I have no Q&A, um, uh, you have multiple execution units actually done for special purposes. So you have adders, you have floating point operations, etc. So they're usually specialized in some way or form, but you have multiple of these, these pipelines going at the same time. So which means that if, if you reach the state uh, of the execution of the first instruction, we actually do not perhaps not only the first, but also multiple instructions at the same time. If we have this and we have no dependencies between instructions, this is why this dependency tree getting to it is very important. And you can imagine that it's also now something which compiler writers have to have to take into account. They're actually writing code so that they're generating it so that the CPU has a much higher chance of, of starting to uh, work on multiple execution at the same time because there are no dependencies between them. So in this case now, so we, we're happy with this. So, but now what happens in this case now, the J, J stands for jump. That's required assembly, by the way, for those who don't know. Uh, what happens in a, in a jump instruction? So we, we have it to the point that we have decoded the jump instruction, but we cannot actually start doing anything else until we actually execute the jump instruction. The executing the jump instruction means that the instruction pointer, which is a register in the CPU, has been up to, updated to point to the next instruction, at which point we can fetch from memory the instruction and decode it, et cetera, et cetera. So, and because we know that fetching from memory and decoding and getting it to the place that we have to actually have the instruction in the real buffer takes time, we actually have dead air here. We have bubbles in, in the pipeline, as people like to call these kind of things. So before we actually get to the point that we can fetch the memory, uh, the location here, and here you see, unfortunately, it's the location. It's supposed to be here, of course. And that's just the problem with the font sizes. So until we are actually at the L3 level here, label here, we have, we have nothing else to do in the meantime. So that's really, really bad. This is where branch prediction comes in. That has been in the news for the last couple of months a lot. <laughs> this kind of, but we see how necessary it is to actually have this. We, if we have what is called branch prediction available, then after the, uh, the this instruction here get, uh, is actually decoded, we can already make a guess as to where it will 
will be, be executing next. And so the CPU will, in most cases, already start fetching memory from somewhere. It's not necessarily the right place, but it, from somewhere it will start memory, uh, fetching memory and decoding instructions. So this is something which is uh, it, which is going on all the time, and uh, well, but it's something at some point it might be wrong. And how do you handle with handle this these kind of operations that you actually get a good prediction? It's a bad prediction because in case of bad prediction, you have to roll back all the computations you're doing and start from scratch. Uh, it, it's, it's a pipeline stall, so you're actually losing lots of performance. So what is being done is we are having um, branch prediction units which are taking which I implement as a state machine using these kind of things. That's a simple one. Nowadays in Exodus 6, you will find something, they have the most advanced one, which is looking something like this, where the branch address, the actual physical address of the branch is taken into account together with a couple of other inputs using a hash function, which is then looking at the global address table, which is using the state machine from the previous one. And this will give you, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's the target address is this. So this actually works remark remarkably well. So there, there's another limit to uh, to the uh, parallel execution and, and so on. And um, this is so if you look at and, and I think they might be wrong. So this, these are these instructions. So these four instructions can be executed in parallel. So but what is about the next instruction now? So this instruction here actually is loading into the A2 register, but in this instruction here is using the AL2 register. So you could say, well, this is a dependency, but in reality it's not. It's what's called a false dependency, and we have to recognize these kind of things. But uh, if we have a single location in the, uh, in, a, uh, in the CPU where the content of a register is stored, then we cannot handle that efficiently. So what is nowadays actually done, instead of having for each, uh, for each register a specific location available, we have what is called register files nowadays. That's a concept which I found most people have no clue about how this actually works. So registers are nowadays not actual locations for data. Registers are pointers into a data structure, a block of RAM, so to say, a very, very fast RAM, where the actual content is based on. And if we come to a false dependency, we are simply allocating memory in the register file for new memory in the register file for the loaded memory in this case, and pointing to this new location and say, oh yeah, by the way, from now the A2 register is actually here. The old memory location stays in place. It's not affected. So the old instruction can actually execute at exactly the same time. That's a clever concept by itself. So, which means that we can actually execute all of these things at the same time because they are not really having dependency problems. So the last thing which I have is I want to uh, introduce is the concept of pipelines. And for that, I give you a couple of nice diagrams. So this is the concept how an adder works in 8-bit adder. And I talked to you already about signal propagation is limited in its speed. So there are lots and lots of gates, lots of transients and end gates and so on going on here. Uh, and therefore, we cannot uh, perform arbitrary and many operations at the same time, so arbitrary complex operations. So as an example, and this is not the case today anymore, so, but imagine you want to have a 16-bit adder available. You can implement this by writing this one here to 16-bit. It gets more and more complicated because you need more and more um, levels of logic to actually uh, handle the propagation of the carry bit. But you can also construct a 16-bit adder by having two 8-bit adders. The, result, the problem is that you need to store for the time the first 8-bit adder gets executed the inputs to the second bit, and you need to store the results of the first adder until the results of the second adder become available. That's using, done using latches. So they are synchronized, uh, they, are, they are on the clock of the CPU, but it means now that you have, uh, using limited logic, implemented 16-bit byte adders, but the result is not available after one cycle, but two cycles. Well, but the lower half is not busy while the second half is being executed. So what happens now in a pipeline, a CPU pipeline, is that instead of waiting for the result of an arithmetic operation, for instance, to be available in, in, in the end, we start with the next operation before that. 
And for our complex ones, like the multiplication, we have actually, I think, the latency nowadays of seven cycles or something like this. We can have multiple of these operations going on at the same time without this. This is an efficient way of doing this, but uh, it requires also help from the compiler, lots and lots of logic in the CPU. Uh, I, have to, I have to make make it quick now, so uh, that's the last slide I actually have. So um, everything was very very simplified in in the talk here. If you want to get an image of how complicated this, this is uh, in a block diagram of uh, Intel Skylake. You see all the things which we talked about here and a lot more, but you can imagine how all these things are, have integrate, uh, so have uh, have interdependencies between each other. And all this has to be put in place, and we have to write code. We have to generate code compilers to actually allow these kind of integrates interplay to actually happen efficiently. We we can very easily write code so that this thing stalls and it behaves like a 10 megahertz processor. The art is to write code to actually utilize all of this logic exactly all of that in parallel at the same time. Only then are these CPUs are really, really good. That's the magic of how we are writing high performance computing code, where much of this is working, where we need to express things like parallelism, not implicitly for the CPU to be discovered and the compiler to be discovered, but we have to make it a little bit more explicit. So this requires programmers help to actually utilize fully. And yeah, this is why we have to understand how CPUs work. So this is just, as I said, not even trying to give you an impression of or knowledge how this actually works. It just serves as, well, hopefully you're going out here now and uh, you're interested in this topic. There's lots and lots of literature, of course, available about these kind of things. And in my opinion, you cannot ever write good code without understanding how CPU works and how compiler works. Right, that's it. <coughs> Any questions? Yes. How does it address those registered those books? You call them registered books? Register files. Files, yeah. You don't see that at all. They're completely, utterly transparent. So you are addressing a register, and at any point in time, uh, yeah, normally there is one single uh, ad uh, entry in the register file which corresponds to one of the um, entries in, in the register. So the re think about the registers being pointer variables all of a sudden. Yeah. That's why I didn't know about that. Yeah. Well, that's what I said. So most people have no fucking clue about these things. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're complicated, Liz. Huh? Uh, yeah. How does it keep track of all, how putting all the pieces of the instructions back together without having all the time? Well, the, the, yeah, there's there's this thing here in the in the whoops, in the bottom. Uh, well, no, it's actually it, 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 it's back in there as well. So. The reorder buffer, the ROP, is the piece which keeps track of everything. So it gives every instruction basically a number and keeps track which instruction has to be what's called retired before what other this uh, instruction. That's the magic piece there. So that, that's unbelievably complex logic. There has been a guy at IBM called Tommaso who in the 70s, I want to say, started writing algorithms for these kind of things which have been implemented in hardware to actually keep track of these things. So it's, 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 there's literature out there. You can just pick it up. Yes? This is one core? This is one core. <laughs> Only. And what's the one core? Uh, no, no, that, that's different. It's one core. Yeah, it's thread? No, no, no. Thread, this can be two threads. I, I didn't even start to power hyper threads because this gets more complicated still. That's what I'm saying. No, no, but this, this is, implements two threads. That's the logic, so I don't want to go into that. That's too complicated, yeah. <laughs> How do things like virtualization extensions figure into this where you know, you're allowing the second operating system yeah. to access it? So, well, uh, maybe I should repeat this actually. So, how does virtualization figure into this? I, I mentioned that I didn't talk at all about memory. You didn't hear me talking about how we actually implement memory there, especially virtual memory and so on. So, if you're interested in this, I have a paper I've written on this a long time ago. It's just 120 pages or something like this about <laughs> this topic. Of them. So, if you want to, if you want to lead, uh, know about that, so I have to 
come back and talk to you for a month about it. So <laughs> it, it, this, this is not so easy. So how this works is the normal virtual memory has there, there is something in there where translation between the address, a program seat, a normal program seat, and which the hardware sees. There's a translation mechanism in there. It's called page table trees. And virtualization just adds another layer of it. It's completely separate edition page table tree, where the, the uh, virtual uh, um, the, the virtual address of the program is gets translated into a virtual physical address, and the virtual physical address gets translated into a physical address. That's the magic band, and there comes some kind, of, some kind of logic in the CPU which makes the inner CPU, uh, OS think it's alone in its world and can do certain operations, have not, and so on, but that's, that's not so important. The most important part is the memory part. And yeah, read the paper, you would not miss. <laughs> I heard people can read it in a month. <laughs> yes? Where's the running Linux? Huh? Oh no, that's not here, so not on these kind of things. The, the Minix part is on the, uh, so this is a core. The large CPU itself has many of these cores and it has things like memory controllers, it has files for the network and so on. And somewhere on it has a little embedded ARC processor, or nowadays Atom processor, which is running Minix, which is outside of that. Yeah, not, but not in this one, so it, it lives somewhere outside. This is, we have nowadays in the high-end Xeons 28 of these on a single chip. In addition to that, we have memory controllers, which are logic by itself, match, massive amounts of logic by itself. Then we have files for Ethernet, etc. Then we have the PCIe hub, etc. And then we have what is the, what is the out-of-band uh, controller itself. And these are the tiny little processors. Intel is using ARM, uh, Exodus 6 nowadays, they used to, used to use ARC, and they are running their own little operating system. This is where the Minix stuff comes from. All right, I guess we have to get out here, so thanks. How we designed processors and they ran at one hertz. Yes. So that I could see what all was happening. I didn't know that if you ran it past two gigahertz or one gigahertz, that you didn't get the stuff back in one cycle. That's news to me. I was like, really? oh, yeah, I didn't know. Well, I was not an EE, I was a computer science guy. So I didn't know there was physics. I'm, a, I'm a CS guy. <laughs> well, that was me. Well, my knowledge is old. <laughs> I'm older than you. I bet that. So Peter and I are proxies. So Yes. I have a quick question for yes. you. Okay, so I write garbage collection algorithms, and we add read barriers. And I have long maintained, and papers have long supported, that you can't put a conditional on a read barrier. That you can, you can do a load, you can do two loads, but you can't do a conditional. And I had somebody challenge me lately, recently, and say... That when, what now, do you mean by conditional? Uh, if GC yeah. cycle is, if thread local flag is true, do something different. Um, and that, that would take way longer than double load. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was lunchtime. Yes, it is. Thank you. It's, it's, You're not yet in. Uh, um, this completely depends on what you're doing. If you have the caches primed, and so on. So if you make everything local to the core itself, the, the, the if doesn't really take that long if it's predictable. So the the uh, the state machine for the for the branch prediction also conditional loads and whatever you want to do, they can be terribly efficient. You just have to make sure that this this hash lookup which is happening there, if you if you design this thing, actually always gets the right address. So for instance, in the in the thread library, so in in the C library itself, code which I have is. To, uh, to uh, prevent the use of the log prefix for Exodus 6 all the time, I actually have check global variable. If the variable is not saying that a multi thread program, I'm jumping over the log prefix, one single byte. And that's actually more performing as if uh, performing a single optimal operation. You just ruined my day. Oh, that's, that's, that's my job. I, I'm wondering about the compression algorithm and used to take the complexity of this topic and put it into <laughs> I'm very commendable that you took on this thing is awesome. Will you have a chance to uh, adjust those slides and then have a 
Look like crap. I'm the only one who writes his own uh, presentation software. You what? I'm sorry? I'm the only presenter here with his own presentation software. I wrote it. <laughs> works. Unlike Bruno, this is a very good setup. It, it worked the first time, doesn't blink, doesn't disconnect. Of course, this time I checked ahead of time. <laughs>